Drs. Michael and Adele McKinney, President and Co-Founders of Promise Christian University, have been equipping global Christian leaders since 1979. In 2002, Promise Christian University was established and has graduated leaders from 16 nations that are impacting their nations for Jesus Christ. We invite you to watch our weekly program, Study with Promise. Our faculty has more than 25 years experience in ministry and the marketplace. We want to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want you to become a student of God's Word and fulfill your divine destiny. He is faithful that promised. Welcome to Study with Promise. Today we're going to study a subject that I believe is very important to all Christians. It is about the blood of Jesus. Today is just the beginning part of it, but we will continue in later studies. At, promise, at Study with Promise, we are trying to give you information that will bless you, first of all, as a Christian, and that will give you all the teaching that you would need so that you would be strong, productive, Bible-believing uh, person that works with the works of God, a laborer in the harvest field where you can have the fruit of God's work in your life. And this subject that I will share with you today is entitled The Blood of Jesus. And I'm taking my text from Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. So if you would turn to that, I would read it for you while you're looking at it. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, it says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Let me give you a little background about this scripture. This scripture is talking about Jesus Christ, and it is talking about in chapter 5, where there was a mighty strong angel that makes a declaration. Because there was a scroll, and that scroll was sealed with seven seals. But no one on earth, no one in heaven, no one under the earth was able to open the scroll. When John the Revelator, John the disciple, saw that, he said, I started to cry. And he says, I wept. In one translation, it says, I wept and I wept. While he was weeping, because there was no one to open that scroll, one of the elders walks over to him and she says, do not weep. There is one that can open the scroll. He is from the tribe of the line of Judah. And his name is Jesus Christ. So he says, I looked into the throne. And in the throne, I saw a lamb as if it had been slain. And the lamb that looked like it was slain comes and takes the scroll. And when he takes the scroll is the scripture that I read to you in verses 9 and 10. There were elders there with their crowns. And they rise up. They take their crowns off and lay it at the feet of the lamb. And they worship him, and they say these words, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. There are powerful concepts to understanding what the blood of Jesus means in this scripture. No one in and, and, uh, the second slide I will show you that no one else could open it. In heaven, there was no one. On earth, there was no one. And under the earth, there was no one. So this scroll 
must have been one of the most important scrolls in heaven. And the only one that could open it was the one that shed his blood, that bought us, that redeemed us with his own blood. And that is why the blood of Jesus is very important. I want to share with you in this teaching four very important points. Maybe today we'll be able to see only the first two, but we will try to see the other two in another later uh, broadcast. The first one is saving and cleansing blood. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10 talks about we are bought, we are redeemed by the blood. First John chapter 1, verse 7 talks about the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And then in the second one, sign, it's the blood is the sign of the covenant. What does that mean? Well, God made a covenant. And the first covenant he made was with a man by the name of Abraham. And when he made that covenant, there was blood that was shed to make sure that that covenant stays. And also in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus was having dinner with his disciples where he takes the elements of the bread and says, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he takes the cup and he says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is shed for the remission of sins. So this blood teaching is a very powerful concept in the Christian doctrine. Today, let's just take a look at what it means when we say the blood of Jesus. First one is the life of the animal is in the blood. And in the next uh, slide, you will see that. Any animal, when they are killed and they die after their blood is shed, while their blood is still in them, they are still alive. Old Testament believers sacrificed animals to make sure that their blood was washed away. So this blood concept is very strong. The shedding of blood is prohibited in the Bible. Eating blood is prohibited. And you say, why? Because the life of the animal is in the blood. And if you violate that blood, that's why the, one of the Ten Commandments says, do not murder. And murder is shedding blood. So this teaching about the blood of Jesus is we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. To pay for our sins, our blood must be spilled. But instead of having us die and shedding our blood, God sent his son to shed his blood for us. And that's why that scripture in chapter 5 of Revelation says that you shed your blood. By your blood, you redeemed us from every tribe, every nation, every people, every tongue. That includes everybody in this world. Because if it's every tongue, every nation, every tribe, then that means all of you that are probably watching this program now are covered. You are under the blood if you believe in Jesus Christ. And how does that work? Well, we have to believe in the blood of Jesus. It is shed already. The price is already paid. But it doesn't become effective until you and I make a decision to believe in that blood. See, my brother, my sister, all of us are going to stand before God someday. And his judgment seat is a justice where a judgment where justice is met. God cannot just excuse one person without appropriate justice. 
if you came before God and your sins are counted and everything is open with God, nothing is hidden from his sight, then the payment for that sin has to be made. In the Old Testament, every year, the Israelites took a lamb to atone for their sins. And usually they took an innocent lamb that would be killed and that lamb's blood would be shed for them so that their sins would be wiped out. In the New Testament, we don't do that anymore. The Bible doesn't teach us to do that anymore. And you say, why? Because Jesus Christ came and shed his blood for us. When you and I make a choice, make a decision to believe in the blood of Jesus, we are literally saying, cleanse me, wash me from my sins by your blood. Pay for my penalty by your blood, Jesus Christ. And I believe you are the Savior. I believe you are the one that came to die for me. So I receive your atoning work. When you and I do that, the Bible says we become born again. Born not of flesh, not of human beings, but born of God. And born of God by his precious blood. So in the next segment, we will continue this teaching. Thank you for being part of Study with Promise. Uh, congratulations to all of the graduates uh, at the Promise Christian University for the year 2017. We are so excited that you have been so faithful to God and to the university in acquiring this accomplishment, which is really very, very outstanding. And you will be able to carry this accomplishment with you the rest of your life. And we are, again, so proud of you. Thank you so much for attending university. And for PCU, let it be a great year, a year in which many graduates will go into the world to preach the gospel, and many more students will come to join us. I love PCU. We're doing what God wants to be done by training disciples and leaders for tomorrow and for today. God bless you as you graduate, and may you have a wonderful life in Jesus. Welcome back to the second half of the teaching on the blood of Jesus Christ. Just briefly, what we covered so far is that we are sinful people sinners before God. But God provided a way out for us. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. On the next slide, which is the next one, the sign of the covenant, we want to look at what it is when we speak about covenant. Covenant in ancient cultures and customs, they had covenants. And they did all their transaction, not by lawyers, not by contracts written on paper, but by cutting blood covenant, sometimes on their thumbs, sometimes on their wrist, sometimes on their palms. They made an incision and they mingled their bloods to become covenant brothers. I was told, and I, in my reading, I heard about it, David Livingston, when he went to Africa, he had no idea what this covenant was. And he had a lot of trouble. But one of the Africans was able to tell him, if you cut covenant with one of the most powerful kings in Africa, he said, you will be protected. So David Livingston, to make a long story short, cut a covenant in Africa and was able to work freely because of the covenant that he had with the African leader. Covenants are very serious agreements. Usually, 
they are not revoked unless by death. The person that gets into covenant with you or with when the two people get into covenant, they usually get into covenant for life. Their blood is mingled. American Indians have the same kind of uh, tradition and culture in which they uh, cut their thumbs and then they mingle their bloods. God did the same thing for us. First, he cut covenant with Abraham. But in the New Testament, Jesus took the wine and he said, this is my covenant of blood with you. And what he meant was in eating of his flesh, which is the bread, and drinking of his blood, which is the wine, the disciples were entering into a lifelong, eternal covenant with Jesus Christ. Today, I want you to think seriously. When you make a decision to know Jesus, to follow Jesus, and you mean it from the bottom of your heart, you mean it with all your being and in highest integrity, you are not just joining a religion. You are not just joining a club. You are not just becoming a member of a church. You are becoming a member of the body of Christ. You are actually cutting a covenant with God. And that covenant, Jesus said, I will not drink of it until I drink with you on that day. What it meant was that covenant will not be broken until we all come before the Lord God on the last day, which is still in the future. What does that mean to us? Well, two things that I want you to get out of this teaching. One, the blood of Jesus Christ is of pure blood, not contaminated. He didn't sin. He was pure. He was indeed the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But he was killed like a criminal. He was put on the cross because the Sanhedrin and the elders and the priests came against him, thinking that he was a false prophet. They did not know that they were fulfilling exactly what God wanted to be done. So this teaching on the blood of Jesus shows us that his clean, pure, holy blood was shed for you and for me. And on the second part of that point, since that blood is shed for you and for me, you and I have a decision to make whether we would like that decision, whether we would like that blood to cleanse us from all our sins and make us children of God, or whether, and I hope it is, it's not this one, or whether we reject that blood and we say, no, we don't want the precious blood of Jesus to cleanse us. I pray that not one person listening to this program will make that second choice. But I pray that everyone will make that first choice. And the choice is this, simply for believing in the blood of Jesus, you can be cleansed from all sin and become a child of God. You can enter into eternal covenant with God. Covenant, by the way, means that your partner is your protector. He fights with you, for you. He protects you. He provides for you. Usually covenants are made between two people, and one may be able to provide food, maybe the farming community, and they don't have soldiers. But there may be another community that has lots of soldiers and warriors, and these two tribes 
enter into covenant to say, you provide us the food, we will provide you the protection. In our case, God is saying to us, you have sin and I have the remedy for sin. If you enter into covenant with me, I will cleanse your sin away for you and bring you into an agreement with the God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth and the seas, so that you will be free from the power of sin. So how do you and I take this thing to make sure that we are part of this covenant? Well, in the next slide, I want to share with you the power of the blood of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 9, it speaks about there is no remission of sin unless blood is shed. As I told you, the animal's blood was symbolic. It didn't really cleanse anybody from sin. It was a symbolic act that they did to show, like a shadow. Old Testament is a shadow of the New Testament. But in the same Old Testament, there were two brothers, Cain and Abel. One day they presented their offering to God. Uh, for one reason or another, one presented a blood sacrifice. He took a lamb and sacrificed it. That was Abel. But Cain brought some grain sacrifice. And the Bible doesn't say God looked at Abel's and accepted and rejected Cain's. He didn't reject. He just looked favorably upon the part that brought the blood with it. Cain was told, and Cain got mad. When Cain got mad, God said to him, very simply, he said, why are you upset? Sin is crouching at your door. You should master it. Don't do that. Just offer a better sacrifice. Well, you know the story, I'm sure. Cain was angry enough to kill Abel, his brother. After he killed his brother, God came to Cain and said, where is your brother? And Cain's answer was, I'm not my brother's keeper. And if you notice, God said something. God said, what have you done? Because I hear the cry of your brother's blood, which you spilled. Abel's blood was crying out to God. Ladies and gentlemen, this blood thing is very, very important for us. If we understand it, it is not a religion. This is a life changing experience. Abel's blood was able to speak to God about his condition. And God heard it. And Cain was judged because of that. The blood of Jesus speaks louder, much louder than Abel's blood. But the blood of Jesus is not crying for revenge. The blood of Jesus is crying for salvation. The blood of Jesus was shed on the cross. The blood of Jesus was shed when they put the crown of thorns on his head. The blood of Jesus was shed when they uh, laid the stripes on him, on his back. The blood of Jesus was shed when the soldier with his spear pierced his side. The blood of Jesus was shed when he was crucified in his hands and in his feet. This blood was not wasted. It is speaking out today. And if I may say so, it's speaking out to say, be saved, be delivered, come and be cleansed by the power of the blood of Jesus. We are studying this powerful subject. We're just kind of opening it up for you. But you can go ahead and continue the study with us because we will, on the next section, on the next broadcast, I will cover the other two topics 
of this very important topic. God bless you. Thank you for being with us.